I am Srimati Karuna, the director of the Gandhi Memorial Center in Washington, D.C. I bring to you this series, Speaking of Gandhi, sharing the messages from the life of the Mahatma. We often hear of the mutual respect and admiration of the Mahatma and the Gurudev, Mohandas K. Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore. Both men shared a commitment to India's independence, yet their personalities differed and their ways diverged. Both men founded universities, both men worked toward village upliftment, and both men sought to raise the consciousness of their fellow beings on this earth. There is a lovely little book by Gurdial Malik about Gandhi and Tagore, and he describes the two men in this way. Gandhiji was the Bhagavad Gita bound in a golden life. Gurudeva Tagore was an illustrated edition of the Upanishads. One was a devotee of duty, the other an adorer of beauty. But both were shipped, though at two different corners, at the self-same shrine of truth. Gandhiji sang the song of service to the accompaniment of the spinning wheel. Gurudeva spent himself in the service of song. One tended the wounded heart of humanity, the other cheered the soul of man. But both walked together in the charmed circle of love. Tagore once said, Human life has its two aspects. One is the discipline of truth, and the other is the fullness of expression. He said, Sabarmati Ashram represents that discipline of truth. For Mahatmaji is born with the pure fire of truth. His nature is one with it. And being a poet, my mission is to inspire life's fullness of expression, he said. And I hope Shanti Niketan carries that ideal in all its activities. Both men also journeyed extensively on long sea voyages and both pursued important writing while situated on water. Whether sailing the high seas or seated on a river houseboat, both were deeply inspired by the rivers of their land. The Sabarmati River for Gandhiji and the Padma River for Gurudev. Such inspiration led to both the expression and the active living of truth. Listen now as Sudeshna Basu, a Rabindra Sangeet singer, recites the words of Tagore. The river has its everyday work to do and hastens through fields and hamlets. Yet its incessant stream winds towards the washing of thy feet. Where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Gandhiji had a great many awakenings inspired by the sea. He made a number of sea voyages over the years. And, of course, he was born in Porbandar, right on the Arabian Sea. In 1907, he even informed his biographer, Joseph Doak, that the sea was almost within a stone's throw from Porbender's walls. 
He said it swept around the city so closely that at times it made almost an island of Porbandar. And as Rajmohan Gandhi, his grandson, wrote in The Good Boatman, that though Gandhiji complained about cars, planes, and trains, never did he say a word against ships. On his second sea voyage, which was in 1891, returning from his years of study in London, returning to India by ship, he maintained a diary of his thoughts and experiences. And in his autobiography, he described the last leg of this journey. He wrote, The sea was rough all the way from Aden. Almost every passenger was sick, yet I was in perfect form, staying on deck to see the stormy surge and enjoy the splash of waves. The outer storm was to me a symbol of the inner. I was feeling helplessness in starting my profession, and as a reformer I was taxing myself as to how best to begin certain reforms. But there was even more in store for me than I knew. I was pining to see my mother. I did not know that she was no more. The sad news was now given, as my brother had kept me ignorant of her death, which took place while I was still in England. The news was a severe shock to me, but I must not dwell upon it. Now listen again to Sudeshna Basu as she recites this poetry of Tagore about light falling upon the dark waters of the heart. After many days has one ray appeared in the cave, upon the dark waters of my heart has fallen a single trace of light. I cannot contain my heart's ardor. The water trembles, it trembles, it talks and sings a complicated tune. Today in this morning, I don't know why my heart has awakened. Early in the day it was whispered that we should sail in a boat, only thou and I. And never a soul in the world would know of this, our pilgrimage to no country and to no end. In that shoreless ocean, at thy silently listening smile, my songs would swell in melodies, free as webs, free from all bondage of words. Is the time not come yet? Are there works still to do? Lo, the evening has come down upon the shore, and in the fading light the sea birds come flying to their nests. Who knows when the chains will be off, and the boat, like the last glimmer of sunset, vanish into the night? We learn a great deal from Gandhiji's own autobiography and from his grandson Rajmohan Gandhi's book, The Good Boatman, in which he writes that Gandhiji was 23 on his third sea voyage in 1893, this time traveling to South Africa. On being informed that all space in first class had been booked for the Governor General of Mozambique, who was also sailing from Bombay. Gandhiji breezily went up to the chief officer of the ship and asked to be squeezed in somehow, and after being surveyed from top to toe, he was given a spare berth in the chief officer's cabin. The ship's captain also befriended Gandhiji, and both spent a lot of time playing chess on board the ship. When Gandhiji's stay in South Africa proved longer than he had expected, he returned to India to collect his family. As there was no ship sailing immediately for Bombay, 
Gandhiji boarded in the middle of 1896 the Pangola, which was bound for Calcutta to pick up a new lot of indentured laborers. During the 24 days at sea, he learned something of two languages he could use in India and South Africa, Urdu taught to him by a Muslim passenger and Tamil, which he studied from a book. He also managed an hour of chess a day with an English officer of the ship. At the end of 1896, Gandhiji took his family and a few other relatives to South Africa. This voyage, when two boats, the Corland and the Nader, sailed together for Durban is fairly well known. Four days short of the Natal coast, a violent gale hit the boats, though the Corland's captain said that a well-built ship could stand him almost any weather. The passengers became inconsolable. The ships rocked and rolled, and every minute were heard sounds and crashes which foreboded breaches and leaks. Everyone prayed in different ways and in different languages, including the captain, to the one and only God. His will be done was the only cry on every lip. Writing of these moments, Rajmohan Gandhi surmises that it is possible that the multi-faith prayers of the future that Gandhiji presided over flowed from this storm. Watching Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and Parsis praying in different languages, Gandhiji sensed that all the messages were aimed at a single address. Gandhiji took hourly reports from the captain to the Corland's passengers and sought to calm them. After 24 hours, the storm cleared, but just ahead was a gale of another sort. This episode is one of an enormous crowd in Port Durban who did not want Gandhiji to land in South Africa. The meeting where Satyagraha was formally endorsed for the first time took place in Johannesburg on September 11, 1906. After the meeting, Gandhiji went to England to ask the British to pressure leaders in South Africa to change the unjust laws. From the ship taking him to England, the Armadale Castle, Gandhiji sent a report for the Gujarati version of the newspaper, Indian Opinion. The ship, he wrote, is as big as a small town. There must be about a thousand persons aboard, but there is no noise, no disorder. Three years later, Gandhiji made another trip to England from South Africa. On the return journey on the Kildonan Castle in November 1909, two very important pieces of writing were accomplished. The first was Hin Swaraj. Seemingly inspired, he wrote ceaselessly. When his right hand tired, he wrote with his left hand. In addition, he translated a long, unpublished piece that Russian author Leo Tolstoy had written called A Letter to a Hindu. I wrote, Gandhiji said, only when I could hold myself no longer. Gandhiji covered 275 sheets of the ship's notepaper with about 30,000 Gujarati words in 10 days. Only three lines were scratched out and very few words corrected. He also tells in his book, The Good Boatman, there was another significant voyage at the end of 1914. Gandhiji's work in South Africa was over. He was now ready to return to India. But first, he went to England, and from there, in December 1914, he sailed for India on the Arabia at the age of 45. During the voyage on the Arabia, he tried to learn Bengali. By this time, his children had already gone to Calcutta and to Tagore Shantiniketan. He, too, would go there before long, and therefore he wanted to learn Bengali. To Albert West, who was editing Indian Opinion in South Africa, Gandhiji wrote from the ship Arabia, I have been so often prevented from reaching India that it seems hardly real that I am sitting in a ship now bound for India, and having reached what 
shall I do with myself? However, lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. That thought is my solace. On Gandhiji's last voyage to England from India in 1931 for the Round Table Conference in London on the Rajputana, he was accompanied by his secretary, Mahadev Desai, Pierre Lal, his son, Devadas, his friend and supporter, G. D. Birla, and his British associate, Madeline Slade, also known as Mira Ben. And remember, her father happened to be an important admiral in the navy of the British Empire. Whether traveling first class or on deck, Gandhiji was comfortable on the sea. During storms, he said, his feet were steady on the swaying deck and he liked the stormy surge and the splash of waves. On calmer journeys, he was captivated by the moon and the stars. In 1925, he said that the sea was an epitome of adventures and added that Indians needed the spirit of adventure in their national life. From 1888 to 1931, Gandhiji made 15 voyages between India and England and South Africa. Rabindranath Tagore also spent time writing upon the water. He spent time on his houseboat on the Padma River, writing poetry. His grandfather, Dwarknath Tagore, had acquired the Shaladaha estate in 1807, where young Rabindranath often went from Calcutta. Parinita Dandekar has written that the tranquil landscape, the pastoral countryside, the timeless fields, and the flowing waters of the Padma River moved him deeply. And Tagore wrote, that the holy place of my literary pursuits during my youth and middle age was the village of Shaladaha, kissed by the waves of the Padma. Tagore, who was a true Renaissance man, poet, composer, playwright, artist, couldn't travel to receive his Nobel Prize in 1913 for his poetry entitled Gitanjali, but he made it to Stockholm in 1921 and made what is now considered his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. He then recalled his time in Shaledaha, the obscure Bengal village where he lived in utmost seclusion in a boathouse. The wild ducks which came during the time of autumn from the Himalayan lakes, he said, were my only living companions, and in that solitude I seemed to have drunk in the open space like wine overflowing with sunshine. And the murmur of the river used to speak to me and tell me the secrets of nature. I passed my days in the solitude dreaming and giving shape to my dream in poems. Tagore expressed the silence that helped him reflect and contemplate. And he doubted if Western poets and writers had the opportunity to spend their youth in such absolute seclusion. Many of his children's poems talked of rivers, boatmen, ferries, and had an unbridled joy infused in them. And he wrote wistfully of the boatmen across the river in Gitanjali. Bengal is literally Nadi Matruk, river-born land. As an artist, the image of a river arises with countless of Tagore's creations. From his first short story, Gatya Kata, the first time he composed his own tunes for his own songs, looking at river Sabramati in moonlight, to the poem which marked his arrival as a serious poet, Nirjahar Swapnabhanga, A Spring's Awakening, and the culmination of his decade-long sojourn on the river, when he wrote the collections Padma and the Golden Boat. At the journey's end, he again looked at the river, Janmadin, as a source of solace. And some of his most productive works took form when he was on a river. He talked of a young mountain stream breaking its shackles in his early youth. And just a few months before his death, he talked of a weary, meandering river spreading out into the delta. 
Listen now to these final words from Tagore, recited by Sudeshna Basu, from The Golden Boat, translated by William Radis. Clouds rumbling in the sky, teeming rain. I sit on the river bank, sad and alone. The sheaves lie gathered, harvest has ended. The river is swollen and fierce in its flow. As we cut the paddy, it started to rain. One small paddy field, no one but me. Floodwaters twisting and swirling everywhere. Trees on the far bank smear shadows like ink on a village painted on deep morning gray. On this side, a paddy field, no one but me. Who is this, steering close to the shore, singing? I feel that she is someone I know. The sails are filled wide, she gazes ahead. Waves break helplessly against the boat each side. I watch and feel I have seen her face before. Oh, to what foreign land do you sail? Come to the bank and moor your boat for a while. Go where you want to, give where you care to, but come to the bank a moment, show your smile. Take away my golden paddy when you sail. Take it. Take as much as you can load. Is there more? No, none. I have put it aboard. My intense labor here by the river, I have parted with it all, layer upon layer. Now take me as well. Be kind. Take me aboard. I look forward to sharing with you more messages each week from the life of Mahatma Gandhi. As he said, my life is my message. <laughs>